It is really good to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. It's a Saturday morning and uh, Friday was just an incredible day for me. There was so much news coming at me. I wasn't sure, you know, what's going to come next. But basically the province of New Brunswick, unfortunately for us, has changed our status. Now we're in zone one. Zone one has been changed to a status of orange. And if you remember a while back, as soon as we hit orange, it means ultimately the church has to close. And we will be closing. Um, effective immediately. We will not have a service this Sunday and not for the next few Sundays until they change our status back from orange back to where it was. Now I got a prayer request or two and that is that we pray number one for those people who have the disease right now. We have an outbreak in Moncton. Pray for those people. Pray that God would touch them. Pray that they would know God or come to know him and pray that God would heal them and make them whole again. Also pray ultimately that God would change this world and take care of this disease, because we know he can. We know he's a great physician, and we know he can eradicate this disease, so pray that God would do so. Now, also pray that this will be short term. Pray that after a couple of weeks, everything will come back under control, there'll be no more new cases, and they will change our color in this zone back from orange, back to where it was, and we can open again. And as soon as they do, we are going to open again. Um, in the meantime, though, as soon as we open up again, there's some other rules that I got notified about also on Friday that we're going to have to follow. And the rules basically say that we got to wear a mask at all times. As soon as you come in the parking lot of the church and you get out of your car, you had to put a mask on. When you come inside the church, you got to wear the mask. There's no time that we're actually allowed to take the mask off. If you're part of the congregation, you must keep it the duration of the whole service right up until you get back in your car again. Now, if you are a singer, there's an exception. If you're singing in the church, and, and you're up front, I mean singing, you're one of the people that are leading the service, you're allowed to take your mask off while you actually lead the service, but the rest of the time you have to have your mask on. For myself, the only time I'm allowed to take my mask off is when I'm preaching. The second that I'm done preaching, I gotta put my mask back on too as well. So these are kind of the, the rules the province has laid out for now. I'm sure they're gonna change over time. I'm sure they're gonna change their minds. Hopefully they will. But for now, those will be the rules when we come back again. So just pray that God will take care of uh, these rules, take care of this virus, eradicate it so that we can get back to the old normal where we can praise God and thank Him and worship Him without a mask on, which is really awesome. But in the meantime, we're going to worship Him anyway because we love our God. And whatever we have to do, we're going to worship our God all the time. And we're going to get in front of the uh, front of his assembly and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us together as one body of Christ. Now, we're going to talk about Thanksgiving here in a moment. And Thanksgiving comes once a year. And often we think about all the things that God's done for us physically. And he's done a lot for us here in North America. But as you go through the church service, you're going to find out that God's also done an awful lot for us spiritually. And I'm going to get us to focus on the spiritual blessings. There's an awful lot of references that I've used in scripture in this particular sermon, but I'm not going to actually give them to you in the sermon itself. So I want to invite you to go to www.mckeesfamily.com. There's a printed out copy of the sermon with all scriptural references, plus all of the uh, biblical references, uh, the bibliography references that I use. Please go there. Please print it off after you get done listening to the sermon and go through those references. It's really important, I think, for us to understand the fields are ripe. They're really ripe. And there's a lot of people dying in their sins. We have the cure. The cure is God Almighty. So may we understand that message and may we share that with the world because we love God and we want to show them how thankful we are by telling the world about Him. Amen to that. May God keep you safe. May God keep you from getting this virus. And if you do have it, may God cure you quickly and efficiently. May God just pour his love all over you and in and through you because he's our God and we are his people. Amen. Giving. My name's Reverend Derek Gilder. I'm the senior pastor here at McKee's Mills Baptist Church. And I want to say God has blessed us beyond all measure. I hope and pray that you're counting your blessings. I know I am. And I know I got so many blessings, especially being here in North America. We got far more than we could ever ask or imagine. And I hope and pray that we're taking that time just to take a breather and say, Lord, thank you. 
Thank you for everything you've done for me. Thank you for all the wonderful blessings that you've heaped upon me. Even though I don't deserve it, you still love me. You still care for me. You still, Jesus, you, you died on the cross for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all that you have done. Today, we're going to look at David's version of Thanksgiving. We're going to look at David in Psalms 138. He gives a uh, eight verses, eight incredible verses, and he thanks God for everything that he has received in front of all of the nations. So let's turn to that passage and let's see what David has to say. He starts off first, he says, a Psalm of David. So right off the bat, we know that this is David that is speaking here. I will praise you with all of my heart, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth. For you have magnified your word above your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and you have made me bold and you've given strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. When they hear the words of your mouth, yes, they will sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk through the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. What a beautiful passage. Thanksgiving. As it approaches. I can't help even now. My, my mouth is starting to water. And my stomach is starting to growl. And I'm starting to think ultimately about all the mashed potatoes, all the turkey, all the stuffing, all the carrots, all the dressing, all the turnip, all on a plate. You know, you just piled up and you piled up some more because nobody judges at Thanksgiving. And then you put gravy over all of it and then you eat it all. You know, and after you're done eating that and your stomach is starting to really feel a little bit weird because you're stretching it absolutely everywhere. Then you go to the dessert table and you take all the apple, blueberry, lemon, pumpkin pies that you could possibly put on your plate and you eat all of that. And then for the rest of the day, of course, you're in agony. You know what? The reality is, is I thank God for all the wonderful blessings that he's given me. And I think it's proper for us as Christians to stop and thank God for the bountiful harvest that we have received. Absolutely. But at the same time, I can't help but think that maybe we're missing something in Thanksgiving. Maybe we're missing out on the fact that the fields of this world are truly ripe. They remain lost. They're dying in their sins. The people all around us. You know what? It says in a lot of the surveys that approximately eight or nine out of ten people are actually not Christians. That means the fields here in North America are incredibly ripe for us to go out and tell this world they have hope. Jesus Christ lives and he can change their very lives. I got thinking about this. Why don't we do this? You know what? On the one hand, I think the indig indignation of those who basically have been given over to the reparate minds to worship idols through their own sullied hands, I think that probably is a little bit foolishness to try to reach out to the swine of this world. But I think on the other hand, though, I think we as royal priests and ambassadors are obligated to proclaim to the lost. Our thanksgiving blessings are not just physical. They're spiritual. This world needs to know that. Yes, I am thankful that I have a house. And yes, I am thankful that I have a car. And yes, I am thankful that I have food. And yes, I am thankful that I have clothing. But I'm more thankful for the spiritual blessings than the physical ones. Because they matter. They last for absolutely ever. Well, Scripture says that we're not supposed to cast our pearls before the swine with all their idols and their glorification of non-existent merit, surely we as God's ambassadors were obligated to sing to them songs of praise. Surely we want to tell them about our kinsman redeemer. I would like to think we do. After all, in doing so, we not only fulfill God's command to be light unto all the nations by sharing every spiritual blessing with them, but we also show God that we love them. 
God, I really love you. And I know, God, that one of your purposes that you have, your overarching desire, so to speak, is that none should be lost. None should perish. I should have the same attitude. I should have the same thoughts and opinions. And I do. But that means I got to get out there and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what this sermon's all about. The following sermon is going to review Psalms 138. It's going to review how David praised God to the lost of the people of his time and how he's telling them all about his radical transformation, God's love, God's protection, God's mercy. He's telling them all about that because he's hoping. David's hoping that the people of the world, the kings of the world might come to know Jesus. And I hope that's what we're thinking about on Thanksgiving too as well. David starts off with this. He says, I will praise you, God, before the world. You know, on his Thanksgiving, he's not necessarily thinking about food, or at least he doesn't express it. He's not necessarily thinking about all the things that he has, albeit David was very thankful for everything that he had. He was thinking about the people of this world. Charles Spurgeon said, There is a time to be silent, lest we cast pearls before the swine. But then again, there is a time to speak openly, lest we are found guilty of cowardly non-confession. I think that's absolutely true. In the midst of the worldly sea of evil adversaries profaning the Most High, David did not fret, he did not cower, but he stood firm on the rock of his salvation and boldly declared with absolute zeal, he says this, I will praise God with all of my heart. Before the gods will I praise unto thee. Amazing. David said, I want to tell the world about God. While the gods David referred to might refer to angels, kings, or judges, he was most likely referring to false gods in which in full confidence he's prepared not to cast his pearls of holy truth before them so that they might, might provoke some arguments with them. But instead he says, you know what? I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing about God. I'm going to sing about his mercy. I'm going to sing about his grace. I'm going to sing that he sent his son to die on the cross. I'm going to sing. David was looking forward in time. He says, I know Jesus is coming. He hasn't come yet in David's lifetime, but he says, I know he's coming, but I know God that you love me so very much. And I'm going to sing about that to everybody who will listen and everyone that will hear. David could have went out in the world and told them all about Jesus. He could have used the words of Jesus Christ and told everybody face to face all the kings. This is what Jesus says, or this is what God says in David's case. This is what God says. And of course, that would provoke all sorts of arguments. Instead, David says, I'm going to praise you in their presence. I'm going to praise you, God. And in doing so, my witness and my testimony will speak much louder than any of my words will. And they will hear my words on top of that. And they will say, what do you have that I don't have? What do you got? He was hoping that ultimately by testifying about God's love, his undying hesed, that he would plow furrows into the stony hearts of those who do not believe. Even though to show his contempt for the false gods was a dangerous exercise because it would greatly offend his peers and all others who held the false gods in high esteem, with great humility of a broken heart over his sins, David boldly bowed with all of his heart and praised God for his perfections as the one and only true God to the world. David was not ashamed. David was not embarrassed. David sat back and said, I love my God and I'm going to tell the world how much he means to me in front of kings, in front of queens, in front of any dignitary or in front of anybody who hasn't got those statuses. I'm going to praise his name. Let praising and singing be our armor against the adulteries of heresy. Let our comfort that we have received ultimately from God be our shield. Let us understand that the truth that we have is really important. We're going to talk about that here in a moment. But let us be a beacon of light to this world and a powerful witness to everyone, regardless of their stature. And that's the first thing that we learn from David. So let's stop. Point number one. and Let's get it clear. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that I have an opportunity, a great opportunity to tell the world about you. Let's go to the next point that David gives us. And this is another good one. I will praise you, David says, because of your word. One of the most profound things we as Christians are to praise God for and share with the lost of this world is 
the absolute truth as found in God's glorious love letter. While the heavens and all of creation testifies to God's eternal power and divine nature, His word surpasses creation as revelation in clearness, in definiteness, and in fullness of teaching. In other words, I can go out right now and I can look at this world. And it's really beautiful, by the way. And I can go out and look at the trees that are starting to turn all the leaves. I love this time of year when you see all the autumn leaves. And it looks amazing. Or I could go to a waterfall and look at the beauty there. Or I could look at the skies and the stars and, and, and see God's presence there. He's everywhere indivisibly present. I can see his creation. And all of his creation, it says in the scriptures, points to him. But that revelation, as important as it is, is not compared to God's physical love letter that he wrote to us. Because he tells us so much more about himself. Contained within his word, we learn that God's unfailing love surpasses our expectations of mercy and justice. Since prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but was inspired by the Holy Spirit, we as Christians are to rejoice that God has has without error magnified his word in accordance with his holy and wonderful name. While some might choose to interpret his word through self-serving lenses, I think every jot, every single tittle that we see inside of God's word is like a lamp unto our feet and food for our souls for those who genuinely want to love God and submit to his authority. God's word creates, sustains, quickens, enlightens, and comforts us. We are to meditate on his word day and night with the assurance of that the absolute correctness of every unfulfilled promise that is inside of God's word and prophecy is just as certain as certainty itself. Above all, David wanted the skeptics and the kings of this world to know that he continually praised God while their dynasties one day would fail Heaven and earth would pass away, but God's word would be absolute and would last forever. David was hoping and in praising at Thanksgiving, he was hoping that they would hear the word of God in his songs. And they would say, oh my goodness, that love letter is for us. Not just for him, but for us. If we only just bowed our knee to Jesus, this could be an incredible Thanksgiving. Of course, they were looking at God and saying, God, the Father, we want to know you. And that's what David was hoping for as he spent time telling the kings all about God's word. Let's go to the next one. So we got number, we got point number two. We praise God at Thanksgiving because he wrote us a love letter. Let's go to number three. I will praise you because you answer my prayers. How many times have we gone to God at two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning and prayed to him? And he's not only answered our prayers, but in many cases has said, yes, what you've asked for is in accordance with my will and I'm going to do it for you. How many times has it happened in our lives? In verse number three, David continues to witness to the lost by telling them of the power of prayer. Unlike their gods made out of wood and stone and bronze that were created by human craftsmen that are in the statues, basically, according to scripture, turn out as deaf, blind, silent, and incapable of doing anything, Isaiah 44, 9 to 20. David tells him the truth. He says, you know what? My God, your God, the only God hears and will respond to you in prayer. He changes this world. He created this world. Therefore, he's going to he's sovereign over it and he can change it. And you need to get in connection with him and you need to worship him. This is important for them to hear. Spurgeon rightly stated, it is the distinguishing mark of the true and living God that he hears and he, he hears our pleadings and he answers them. And he says, the gods... False gods don't do any of that. They can't affect anything on this earth. It is through the courage and the strength of God that those enriched by his innumerable mercies can boldly say that their father is not only able to interpret their tears and cries, but always responds to them in a manner that's always going to be good for them. In other words, when we go to God and we ask him for something, we don't always get what we ask for. Not always. Absolutely not. Our God would not be a gracious God, would not be a merciful God, would not be a just God if he gave us everything we asked for. Many times we ask for things that are not good for us and are not going to turn out well for us at all. God gives us what is going to work out for our good, Romans 8, 28. And we have that wonderful promise to stand on. 
This, of course, does not mean that God is like a lackey. He's not a genie in the bottle. And we cannot go to him and say, look, this is what I demand of you. That we certainly cannot do. But the Lord always promises us to love us, to cherish us, to protect us, and to always, through his electing love and sovereignty and grace, always be for us and never against us. Always listen to our prayers. And when we ask for forgiveness, always to grant it. Now, there's something to be thankful for. Thanksgiving is knowing and understand that we are forgiven masterpiece of his grace. Let's praise God. That prayer is ultimately the central avenue in which God chooses to transform us. For it is when creation talks with its creator that we learn that we are given divine power to be right in front of a holy God. That's really nice. At Thanksgiving, it's nice to sit back and say, God accepts me, not because of the things I've done, but because what Christ has done for me. He accepts me, and I'm one of his children, and I'm going to live with him for an eternity. Amen. That's Thanksgiving. Let's go to the next one. David goes on and he says, I will praise you because I know that you are sovereign. In response to the skeptics and the kings of the world and their various attacks on David's belief in one but one true God, he chose not to seek retribution against them, but he chose to sing of his glorious creator in hopes that in hearing God's word, they might come to know God too as well. He wanted them to know and to understand that God is sovereign over all things both seen and unseen. Though the kings of the earth often see themselves as gods and the narrow path is offering little to entice their carnal minds, David sang the words of God in hope that they might look past their own presumed glory to see, hear, adore, and obey the one whose majesty and sovereignty has no equal. He was hoping for that. For those who chose to remain steadfast in their belief in the false gods, David, David's praise also serves as a warning. He says, you know what? There's going to be a future. The future is coming. You will not always have unchecked human power. There's going to come a time when God is going to assert his authority. His Messiah will return. And at that time, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All the kings of all the nations and all the people will bow on that glorious and that absolutely wonderful day. Well, David looked forward to that glorious day. In the meantime, he was delighted to be a missionary through his verbal praises of his portion. His one heart's desire was God and he wanted to share that with the world. And he was delighted to do so. On Thanksgiving, are you ready? Are you willing? If somebody comes up to you and asks you why you have reason, what's the reasons you have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, are you ready to tell them? Are you ready to go and make disciples of all nations and get out there and tell them, I love my God. Why? Because he's sovereign and he is the only God. Are you ready to tell them that? I hope and pray so. Because on Thanksgiving, if we really want to tell God, thank you for all you've done, I think we do it best by telling the world all about him. I think that's the best way we can say, thank you, Lord. Just thank you. David goes on. He says, I will praise you because you help the lowly. Oh, by the way, the lowly is me and you. God is to be especially praised for his mercy. Though he is wholly other, exceeding the loftiest soarings of our imaginations, though heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool, Isaiah 66, 1, God is aware and he looks after the lowly, the meek, the guilty sinner saved by grace through faith. That's all of us. And praise be to God, he sees us that way. Remembering the humble beginnings as a shepherd boy, how God had saved him ultimately from uh, King Saul over and over again. This is a really tender spot for David. He says, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're sovereign. Thank you that you protect me. Thank you that you guide me. Thank you for your abundance of mercy and your justice, Lord. Unlike the unbelieving kings of the earth, David refused to have confidence in himself, but instead he found strength, salvation, and peace in the bosom of his creator. While God has great compassion for the lowly, David warned the kings of the earth that God also has great disdain for those who vainly exalt themselves. 
One glance from afar, God not only knows of their emptiness and their offensive ways, but of bowing down to false God, but he also promises to vindicate by setting all the captives free. In other words, they will not oppress the people of the world forever. God ultimately, though, wants them to know him. And that's David's, that's what he's trying to say. God wants to know you. He wants to know everyone. He helps everyone regardless of their status. They all come to the cross the same way, the same way we all do. And that's on our knees. That's on our knees. For David, he was trying to tell the world, God is gracious, God is kind, God is good, and God loves you all, and God doesn't want any of you to perish. And he wanted to tell them that God is sovereign and he wants to help everyone on this earth come to know him. But you have to say, yes, Lord. Yes, I want to know you. Next one he says is, I will praise you ultimately because you preserve my life forever. And he actually finishes the passage on this. David finished his song by praising and rejoicing that God saved him from his enemies with his right hand. God vindicated him. God preserved him. And God would love him, not just today, not just tomorrow, but for absolutely ever. Though many times David must have felt like God had prepared a table in the presence of his enemies, uh, he was confident that God would strengthen and preserve his life, not based on his own merit or even based on God's past deliverances, but on the grounds of the character of God himself, for God's love endures forever. He is for us, not against us. Even though David knew Yahweh was the holy other God of the heavens and the absolute truth did not stop him from having faith. He said, I have the absolute truth. And even though the absolute truth would cause a little bit of argument and friction with the people of the world, David said, I still want to tell you about the absolute truth. I want to tell you the truth about God. And even God chose ultimately to, to tell David, you know what, you might be persecuted by your enemies for a while. David said, that's okay, because I know you'll protect me. I know you'll sustain me. I know you will keep me in the bosom of your hand. I know you are for me, God. And he stood with assurance, great assurance, that God was for him. A fellow named J.W. Uh, Burgeon wrote the following, and I think this is really nice. And this is really going out of context to David, because now we're going to talk about Christ in here. And I, I have talked about Christ a fair amount in this sermon, because I'm trying to bring it to us at the same time. Of course, David didn't know Christ at that time, but I'm going to bring it to modern day setting. This is what this fellow says. His creating hands formed our souls at the beginning. His nail pierced hands redeemed them on Calvary. His glorified hands will hold our souls fast and not let them go forever. Unto his hands, let us commend our spirits, sure that even though the works of our hands have made void the works of his hands, yet his hands will again make perfect all that our hands have unmade. What a beautiful passage. Like What a beautiful quote by this fall. Amazing. Above all, thanksgiving is all about praising God, his love, his supremacy, his rule, his kingdom will last forever. And guess what? He gets us to join him. He wants us to join him. If we are born again believers, we're going to heaven. We're going to spend an eternity with him. Now that's a thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise be to God. Thank you. I love the food. I love the dressing. I love all the things that I eat. But thank you, Heavenly Father. More importantly, that I'm going to be with you for an eternity in heaven. Thank you, God, that you think of me that way. And all of us that way. I want to finish with this. Yes, Thanksgiving's almost here. And by the time you listen to this sermon, it's going to be on a Sunday, so you only got a little bit of time to go. And Thanksgiving is going to be here. And I know that ultimately my mouth is starting to water and my stomach is beginning to growl. And I am thinking about the mashed potatoes, turkey stuffing, carrots, dressing, turnip, all smothered in gravy. And I am thinking about all the apple, blueberry, lemon, pumpkin pies that I'm about to eat. I'm thinking about all of that. And I'm really thankful that I can actually eat that food and that God's blessed me in the physical world in so many ways. But after hearing God's pra David's praise for God in Psalms 138, surely our hearts go beyond just the physical and we go to the spiritual. Surely we're looking out at the fields and we can see ultimately the fields are ripe. There are many people who are dying in their sins and we have the cure, or at least we know about the cure, I should say, and that is God. 
We need to tell them about God, our Creator. This very day, amidst the glorious obligation that we have to God, I think we got to tell this world how much we appreciate God's grace, His mercy, His protection, and His love by planting seeds all across this world. Even though telling those who believe in many gods, especially the God of self, might provoke their indignation, possibly even their wrath, we might get persecuted a little, May every single jot and tittle of his glorious love letter guide our footsteps when we go out into the world. And may we tell them, God has a love letter for you. You need to read it because he loves you. And guess what? No matter how bad you've blown it, no matter how much you sin, no matter how lowly you are, yes, he still loves you. He still cares for you and he will lift you up. We need to tell the world that. We need to tell the world that God's word creates, sustains, quickens, enlightens, and comforts me so very much. You need to read God's love letter. We need to tell the world that this Thanksgiving. So may we boldly pray before the world not for our reputation's sake, but to show the lost that while their gods cannot see, hear, speak, and though heaven be his throne and earth be his footstep, those who are bought at a price, those ultimately who accept Jesus Christ and have faith in him, can come to know him, can be forgiven, can be transformed, can be a brand new creation in Christ and can spend an eternity with God the Father in heaven forever and ever. Amen. Now that is thanksgiving. That's thanksgiving. That's what I'm truly thankful for. That God saved a wretch like me. And he wants to save all of them. And I don't know why. But for some incredible reason, God has chosen us to be his hands and feet and wants us as his ambassadors and as royal priests to go out there into the world amongst the skeptics, amongst the people that have all sorts of false gods. And he wants us to let our light shine very clearly and very brightly this Thanksgiving and say, I have hope for you. I have a message from God for you. I have a Bible in my hand. And that message is amazing. And you need to read it. You need to hear it. Because your God loves you. Even if you don't love him, he loves you. And he wants you to know him this very day. I am thankful that we get that privilege to go out there and tell him that message. And I hope and pray you feel that thanksgiving in your heart today too. Amen and amen.